Thanks so much for coming. I appreciate you coming to the early morning session. Um, as I mentioned before, if you go through my GitHub, you'll get access to everything. Hopefully you've had a chance to go into. I'll have another slide for you uh, about that. So, when I was young, say a teenager, there was this electronic shop over by where I used to live. And I thought it was so cool to be able to, you know, fix anything electronic. I mean, it's, it's mysterious. What's actually happening inside that TV set? And so I actually went to them one day and said, can I intern? You don't have to pay me. I just want to learn how to do this. They said no, <laughs> sadly. But that was kind of the start of my desire in this regard. I kind of tabled it a little bit. The film was rejected, but that's OK. I didn't let it go. Move a little bit further, I went to college, took a couple of physics classes, got to play with breadboards and some electrical components. Amazing stuff. Um, still didn't quite maintain it as a hobby as I should have, because I was into programming more at that point, and programming was amazing. I could create my own world. It was awesome. I should have had the thought, hey, what if I can connect programming to electronics? I didn't, sadly. But then, fast forward to a couple of years ago, when we start seeing some really cool things happen. We start seeing the Raspberry Pi. We start seeing the Arduino and the BeagleBot now. These projects um, give physical computing um, access to general public like never before. And that's when we got into the Raspberry Pi. So now, I've taken what was a dormant hobby and made it into something that's been more of an active hobby since then. Um, I honestly am still learning. In fact, this is definitely for people that are much more into programming and want to get into the electronic side of things. If you're an electronic engineer, you probably won't get much out of my project because it's simple in comparison, but there's a lot of a lot of interesting stuff on the programming side too. So you may, if you don't know the programming, this could also help you. Here's a couple of the cool things that uh, you can actually do with Raspberry Pi nowadays. This is the Brick Pi. And essentially what someone did is instead of using a normal Lego Mindstorms controller, they said, I'm going to make my own Raspberry Pi. So they actually did a Kickstarter. Uh, it's, it was successful. They built kind of a casing, as you can see around here. And then you can connect it up to sensors and motors with Lego Mindstorms and do whatever you want. It is amazing. I haven't gotten into it yet. Another very recent entry, someone created their own cell phone with a Raspberry Pi. Very, very cool. Um, and, you know, it's just a Raspberry Pi underneath there, and then a circuit board mounted on top with a touch screen, uh, a lot of code, and there you go. These are examples of the awesomest things you can do with a Raspberry Pi. Um, I'm starting with the basics. Here's my edition for this presentation. Thank you. Essentially, I decided I wanted to see what I could present in terms of with basic components. Resistors, LEDs, buttons. Very simple to work with, very cheap. So I did, but I built a game out of it. I built the old game of Simon. Those of you from the 80s may remember this game. I certainly enjoyed it when I was a kid. Um, I can't say that I completely replicated its algorithms, but I have done enough to actually make a Simon game which you get to play with with the code on my GitHub. And we'll play with it a little bit today. Why don't we go ahead and show you now exactly what it is so we can get the demo out of the way. Maybe I'll show you more later. That way, just in case we run out of time, we will show you the cool thing. So it's right here. But for those who can't see it, I actually have a cam on it so that you can look up here. And all I'm going to do. is run my Simon program. A lot of Pi products end with Pi, so I decided to do the same thing and create Simon with Pi. So why not? It was cool. Um, I actually didn't see if it, like, it probably lit up. It did. So I'm going to press probably the wrong button. Oh, I pressed the right button. Awesome. <laughs> that was a like, total guess. So as you can see, it'll show a pattern. And then if you get it right, it flashes for it. Oh, wait, no, actually I got it wrong. That was, that was the wrong flash, sorry. So which one did it go next? Red. Red. So you see, now it tells me that I was successful. So I had it just do kind of a sequential lighting. One is successful, one is wrong. 
So did it go to red this time? Uh -huh. So that was successful. As you can see, it'll keep ramping up the pattern. I didn't do much with speed. I just pretty much got the patterns and stuff working. And then, of course, the error detection so that it'll reset. Created a simple little command line console. You can debug stuff out if you want to. And uh, also, just control it. You, know, you can actually reset your pattern. And it'll reset it. And then, of course, wait. So that's it. That's what I'm going to show you in a new day. So um, I hope we have some fun here. Um, hope it interests you enough. It is a simple project, though it did take me a couple months because I went so far as to get into a lot of the physics of things. And I, I like learning about the background of everything, too. So I honestly hope that you do the same because hardware isn't necessarily hard, but there's a lot to it. And really, it's if you get into it, you won't need necessarily more than algebra. And I'm even going to get into some of that, too. So let's go back to the slides. All right, so that's what we're working on. So the talk, I'm going to go into a little bit of the theory of physics. I hope not to bore you too much. I'm not going to try to be even too detailed. I don't have the time. It's not a physics class, I'm sorry. But I'm going to go into a couple of the more important things. I ramble, so I might deviate a little bit. I'll try to stay on track. Then we'll go into some of the hardware, uh, specifically more stuff with GPIO and Raspberry Pi. And then lastly, we'll dig into some of the software. Current, the flow of electrical charge measured in amps. One part of Ohm's law. We'll get into a little bit of that in a minute. This is essentially how electrons move across a conductor. Uh, we're specifically working in direct current. So in electronics, you do work with AC when you're converting, but electronics don't like uh, electricity coming back and forth over the line. They like it going one way, especially things like diodes. I'll explain a little bit about that more, but yes, direct current, and that's how we get things to happen. Nothing happens without current. Voltage, the difference in potential between two charts, uh, bodies. More simply, this point has a higher potential, meaning there's a lot more electrons here. This point doesn't have as much. When you connect them up, it moves from the higher to the lower. It's kind of like water pressure, same kind of concept. Measured in volts. Sometimes you'll hear this called an electric motive force in books, depends on the book. Resistance, opposition to current flow. Very important. Without resistance, we wouldn't really have electronics. Most electronics have a form of resistance. You have resistance. Everybody has resistance. Um, you might hear the term impedance when you're going through and doing some research. It doesn't really matter in terms of DC. They're about the same thing. In alternating current, though, they're different. Uh, just keep that in mind. So if you hear impedance with, with DC, there's no difference. So those three components make up Ohm's law. This is kind of your bread and butter law of, ele uh, of electricity, and certainly of electronics. When you're building circuits, you're going to need to do some math to figure out resistances or currents or voltages at certain points in your, in your circuits. You're going to want to know this. Uh, that's just pretty much the three forms of the same function, so simple algebra. Uh, this is kind of an illustration of how it works in terms of the circuit. So you have your voltage source. Your conventional current flow moves around the circuit, starts from positive to negative in terms of conventional current flow. Of course, electrons are actually going in reverse, so they're going from a negative to positive because electrons are negative. And then it will go across any of your electronic components, which will be the resistance in your circuit. Uh, something to note, sometimes in some books, you'll see E instead of V for voltage in terms of Ohm's law. Don't get confused. It just depends on the book. Like, the really the really high level physics books, they're using E for electric motive force. So circuits. The idea of a circuit is generally a closed loop of electrical components. The idea of a closed loop is you've got your conductor, it goes from the positive voltage to the negative, it, it's going to let current flow. Um, these are technically circuits. You'll see these again. These are more just series of resistors and uh, in series and parallel. 
but it's the general idea of how circuits work. Either you have your components connected positive, negative, positive, and negative, or you might actually have all of the positive terminals connected and all the negative terminals connected, and different sort of effects happen. I'll talk a little bit more specifically with resistors <coughs> because we're using those. In general, um, the other components we're using, we'll, we won't have to worry about parallel as much. Then there's a short circuit, which is a stray lightning bolt that causes tensions in robots. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Need it's an unintended or accidental circuit between two points. So this is why if you drop your phone in a bucket of water, it breaks if it's on. Because the water is getting into your circuit board and causing short connections to other parts, which allows electricity to flow to those other parts, which could be too much for current or voltage and overheat and <coughs> burn the circuitry. <coughs> you have to do this in electronics. There's just no way to get around it. It's better if you can avoid it. I haven't burned a pie yet. So. Um, and the thing to note, electricity always travels a path of least resistance. And that's why short circuits are so bad. Because as soon as you got one, it's going to, it's going to happen. Heat, that brings us to heat. Dual heating and direct current. I couldn't find a simpler name. But essentially, this is the power law. And this pretty much says that if you have current and voltage, they're, you multiply them together, you get power. Power in electronics generally is heat. It's represented in watts, so you've heard wattage. And you'll see on most of your components a wattage rating. Don't let it get hotter than this. Especially, just every resistor has a wattage rating. Most of the other things will probably see it too. Um, it's very important that you know your wattage. So that's why you need to watch what sort of current and voltage you're actually running through your components. A little bit about safety. Um, if you got to Kevin's amazing talk yesterday showing a lot of the different capabilities of the Raspberry Pi GPIO, uh, he will have told you, of course, that we're working in lower voltages. It is a bit safer. I agree. It is. However, you should still be cautious. You should still be careful. You should be aware that accidents can happen. I mean, technically speaking, currents as low as 5 milliamps can be dangerous. You can generate 5 milliamps on a Raspberry Pi. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get electrocuted because your body has resistance too. And generally it's pretty high. Perspiration, um, water, or cuts can also impact that, but you probably won't have to worry about electrocution. You may get a shock, depending on what you're doing, if you're not quite working the way you should be on a Raspberry Pi, because you can feel current as low as one milliamp. You'll feel it. You'll want to move away from it. That brings up the last point. Just don't work on your project while they're live. There's a couple of tricks I'm going to talk about doing that. Um, but in general, make sure there's no power to your project. Electrical fires. Not as likely to happen again. We're working with low voltages, but it could happen. Maybe you accidentally overheated a piece and you had some paper near it or something. You started a fire. Or maybe your project catches on fire, which would be horrible. But you don't know. It could happen. It's good to have a couple things on hand. These are cheap. Baking soda, obviously, really cheap stuff. You can just smother it. You probably are not going to want to use components after that, but it works, and your components might be fried anyway. Another option that might be a little cleaner is like a Class C fire extinguisher. This is a handheld version. It's about that big, so like an aerosol can. It just generates a tunnel of CO2, puts out any fire. That's also really handy because it'll do any other type of fire too, not just electrical. So very good thing to keep on hand. I got that for like 15 bucks at, uh, at a hardware store. Here is the shopping list, sort of. There's some things, of course, that you can bring with you. Uh, I, I purchased, a, in this case, the Raspberry Pi Model B. I like them better, obviously, because you've got double the RAM. Um, you've got a little bit more away. You've got two USBs. You've got enough in a port. You've got a little bit more to it. Uh, you're going to need your SD card, that's your hard drive. Uh, you're going to need a power supply, obviously. A lot of these things you'll get when you purchase a Pi. Some things you want, it depends on what you're doing. <coughs> Peripherals, you know, if you want to access your Pi, you might need that. Uh, I actually have mine connected up through an Ethernet cable directly to my laptop. There's some tricks you can do things like that, so I just SSH in directly. Um, find stuff online like that. Then, of course, or, you know, if you have a spare monitor, you can hook it up from HDMI to DVI. Um, whatever you want to do. Wi-Fi dongle, if you don't want to deal with Ethernet. 
Pi Cobbler, I'll get into that a little bit more. This is one of those things that will help you with safety. Uh, ribbon cable, very handy also for safety. Uh, breadboard, wires, uh, resistors, uh, four momentary switches, and then four LEDs. That is pretty much that project right there in a nutshell. One other thing you can kind of do to help out, if you don't want to just go and start buying stuff piecemeal, is you can go to, uh, you can go online, you can go to uh, Tom Storm like Radio Shack, and you can find uh, kits. They're great. In fact, this one came in a kit. So it came actually with a, an initial breadboard, some resistors, LEDs, buttons, various things. More than what I actually used for this, and technically something that I didn't use out of it, so I did buy some extra components. Uh, the resistors, for instance, the 220 ohm resistors weren't part of that kit. Resistors are actually really cheap, though. In fact, all the components are pretty cheap on their own, so you won't have to worry too much about cost. And you know, Raspberry Pis are what, 35, 45 at most in terms of price. Great. So it's really cheap. If you break it, it's really cheap to replace. A couple other things you might want: um, needle nose pliers. We're not really doing any soldering or anything. So you don't necessarily have to do any like surface mount uh, soldering. If you had a chance, also over at the, the transistor has been doing this thing uh, at the hack center where you put together your little circuitry. Oh man, that was so cool. That was very fun. Uh, to get that to work is very satisfying, and it's simple to solder on a circuit board as they show you. So they provide you the circuit board and everything ready. You just do it. They actually took me an hour though because I had a bad solder bag. But uh, I saw one guy next to me got a really good one. He was also amazing. It took him like ten minutes. So. Head down there and try it out if you haven't yet. Uh, it's amazing. And then the digital multimeter. I recommend digital for these types of projects because it has a couple other bells and whistles. Um, some purists will say use an analog. Might be good to have both, but if you're choosing, start with digital, especially for your beginning projects. They're pretty cheap nowadays. I think I got mine for like 30 bucks or a radio shack, I think. Now that the Raspberry Pi, you will see right there, this is what we're focused on. This is the GPIO. Um, if you were in Kevin Scott, he'll have also shown you some of this, so you might be familiar with it. If not, just know that this is two sets of 13 pins, pins each, um, and this is how we're going to communicate with our electronic project. You can do a lot more than what I'm showing you. Here is a more um, abstract layout of it. So you've got 26 pins on it, obviously. 17 are technically programmable. So even though some pins are, pins are set to other things like UART, IPC, and SPI, you can still reprogram those for your projects. So don't think you have to be stuck with just the eight normal GPIO pins. You don't. You can use any of the pins on there for anything you want. You can reprogram. Except, of course, ground should say ground, voltage should say voltage, obviously. There are two. Um, you'll see this a lot. You'll see 3D3. That just means 3.3 .3 volts. They just replaced the view with a decimal. You'll see that a lot in long books. Uh, two five volt, and then five ground. Now, technically speaking, on our Revision 2 board, there's even another expansion slot. You'd have to do your own kind of soldering to get this to work generally. You, know, you probably can find some that you can purchase. But it has an additional 8 <coughs> on it, so another 4 GPIO, 1 3 v 3 1 5 v and 2 more ground. So that is another option, especially in a, a really big project. I want to talk a little bit about pin logic inputs. Um, so essentially, we want digital when we're working with programming. We want zeros and ones. Electricity is analog. So that means it could be in any sort of range. The, the Raspberry Pi will obviously, it works off of the 3v3 uh, voltage, as you might have heard from Kevin's. But it uses that voltage as kind of its range for what's one, what's zero. So Temp, the top 10%, so 3v3 to like 297, if I'm doing my math right, off the top of my head, um, is 1, tie, and then 0 to 0.33 is low. Anything in the middle is called floating. Floating bad. That's when you start getting things happening that you don't expect. Like you're expecting something off, but in, you're getting on. It's bad. So uh, there are ways to actually fix this in in the GPIO software and through electronic components. I actually did the electronic component way just as an example, but I'll explain a little bit about both. Outputs, a little bit more simple. Essentially, you're going to set it on or off. It's a, if it's on, it's 3v3. If it's off, it's zero. 
That's a goal. In terms of safety on working with your GPIO header, a couple things. Static glass electricity can be bad. Avoid scuffing your feet on the carpet before working on your electronics components, or at least ground yourself. Um, and generally, you probably won't hurt anything. You're not working with anything too sensitive. But you know, you could do things like get a humidifier. You could use anti-static devices like the wristband or the mat. They even have like an anti-static lotion. Uh, electricians use it a ton. So there's plenty of options in terms of that. If you generate, happen to be one of those people that generates tons of static, even a humidifier, making your air a little bit more humid, can help with static electricity. Uh, be wary of the five volt. Notice I mentioned three D three a lot, not really five. It generates five, but it doesn't accept five. Though. If you ground or if you short circuit five to your ground on a Raspberry Pi, you probably lost your Pi. At the very least, you lost your pins, your ground. It'll burn out. So be careful. There are, of course, a lot of things you're going to want to use 5 volt for. So just when you're getting into that, know that you're going to want to start knowing what's coming. You're going to want to know how your circuit's going to behave. You're going to want to start doing those, start relying on Ohm's law and your knowledge. So start with 3v3 and play with stuff. This, of course, entirely uses 3v3. A lot of simple projects do. It's, believe it or not, that is a lot bullish to, to do uh, stuff with. So uh, work with 5 when you start moving it. And don't connect exposed wires directly to your Raspberry Pi. This is a biggie. Don't just go and, oh, I got some wires, I'll just hook it up here. That's a quick way to short circuit your Raspberry Pi. If you put a 3G next to the ground, there's a short circuit. And it's very easy to nudge your wire and have it touch another pin, it's over. Um, it may not happen, but your inputs and outputs are the same thing. You could be setting something up as an out output and one's high, one's low. That's 3D3 versus ground. That's a short circuit. You burn your pins. Um, so yeah, don't do it. There are other options. Here's the one that I'm using here. I, I'm pretty happy with this option also in terms of uh, prototyping. I'll explain why. But this is called Pi Cobbler. And essentially, all it is is an extension of your GPIO. So you connect the ribbon, uh, the ribbon into your GPIO. And then you connect the other side to your Pi Cobbler, which I have on this, but you can have the bigger one right here. And then on the other one side, it's male, so it connects right into your breadboard. Very nice. And then, when you want to work on your project, instead of just in, in, in make it all live, just pull out, the, pull out the ribbon. That's simple. You don't have to turn off your Pi because it's direct, connectly, connected directly to your, your breadboard. It's a great option. You could use female jumper cables and do kind of the same thing. The only trick there is then you're still exposing your Raspberry Pi and you have, you're putting in jump cables to get them out. So there could be static electricity. Um, you could be choosing the wrong one. This one, you're never going to choose the wrong one because they're, it's the same position as your GPIO. Uh, many of them will also show what sort of um, capabilities each pin has. This one didn't. Uh, actually, the one on here does. It shows like this one's 3D3, this is 5 gram. So it just depends on There's a couple different varieties of pie coppers. <coughs> Here's your breadboard. Uh, this is pretty much the way to prototype. You don't necessarily need to do soldering and circuits. You can just take components and put them on. You do need to avoid surface mount component, components if you do this, of course. If you have a surface mount component, then it's going to be flat. There's no pins. You can't hook it in. That's what all these holes are. These allow you to put your components in there and connect them. <clears throat> Here's kind of how it works. So on the top side and bottom side, or left and right, depending on your orientation, are these long rails. And you'll see the lines. Those are your bus strips. And those are where you generally want to put your voltage in your ground. Red is usually voltage, so the other color will be brown, whether it's black, blue, etc. Uh, some of them come with only one strip on either side. Some of them come with two. This example, for instance, had two. Then you also have your thread strips here. Now, oh, these bus strips are completely connected across that whole row. So that is one complete conductor on either side. Same thing here at the bottom. Now, the thread strips are a little bit different. These are connected only on each row, and they're also divided in medium. So you have a ton of smaller conducting lines here. And that's how you start connecting your components up. You'll put like one of the component here in this row, A1, and then put another one in A2, 
and then there's your positive vision A. And then you connect another component in A2 to A3, and that's how you start building a series um, circuit. Parallel would be like you put all the positives in one row and all the negatives in another, for instance. I'm only actually working with series circuits because I was trying to keep this simple. Uh, so you don't have to really worry about parallel, but I mention it because you see it a lot and it has its uses. Momentary tactile switches, very useful on and off buttons. Depending on the type of switch you get, it's either in an on state and then you press it to turn it off, or it's an off state and turn it on. For these, I chose an off state and then I'm turning it on. If you press it, then you close your circuit and then things happen. Uh, one thing you'll notice about these is, is that they are, you'll see there's a surface metal one also. Those are the ones you don't necessarily want to use for your breadboard. But the other ones are okay. You'll see they have four pins. Um, there's only generally one connection, even though there's four pins. So there's some tricks you can use for that, but um, I think on this one, well, let me do that. I think on this one, for instance, the, that's a connected side and that's a connected side. So these sides would be opposite. So when you press it, then everything's connected. It might be tricky when you're starting out to actually know what that is. That's why you can actually use your multimeter to help you. This is one reason I want you to get a digital one. And it'd be good if you find one with a continuity setting. And a diode setting, I'll get to that in a minute. But if a continuity setting will actually pretty much say, okay, it'll, you put two testers, positive, negative. If it's open, then nothing will happen. If it's closed, that means you've got a connection, it'll be. So then you can actually tell what's closed, what's open on your, on your, on your buttons. Very simple way. Um, the knee nails pliers, this is the reason for them. Your pins are crimped, which works really good when you put them in a circuit board, pretty easily. But it doesn't work so well on a breadboard. It wants, it's more of a straight hole, so straighten out your pins. Resistors. Uh, you'll see resistors generally in flats like this. This, is, of course, is a longer one. Here's a couple things related to resistors. First, of course, resistors. They are your bread and butter in how you pre uh, uh, present resistance in your circuits. This is how you make it so that there's not too much voltage on any other electrical components, so you don't burn them out. You also don't want to burn out your resistors. You need the proper resistance. Here's a couple of formulas I threw in there uh, for resistance. Um, I'm not actually using either one. I'm only using the single resistors. But you could know that if you don't have quite the right sizes, you can add them up. So if you put them in series, you can make a 220. Or close, make a 250 if you add a couple hundreds and a 50 together, for instance. So with resistors, if you don't quite have the components, just remember you can work around that. For some reason, you don't want to go buy some more. But they're really cheap, so you don't need to worry about that as well, generally, for the cheap like 25 watt ones. Uh, the higher the wattage, usually, the more expensive the resistor. Also, tolerance matters. I'll get into that a little bit. But you don't need to work with expensive ones for something like this. Resistors are color coded. So you see these little colors on them. Uh, sometimes there's five, sometimes there's six, it just depends. Essentially, there's a, this is a, a color chart. You, you can find color charts online. You can get hard, uh, if you buy a kit, it might actually come with one in a cardboard, it's great. So uh, you probably don't necessarily want to remember all the colors, so have one handy until you do. There's actually uh, mnemonics out there to remember uh, the colors, so a lot of creative stuff. I mentioned tolerance a little bit. Tolerance is essentially, a resistor isn't exact, it's analog. So that's plus or minus whatever percentage that this could be. So it might not be exactly 100 ohms, 220 ohms, but it's close enough. Of course, higher tolerances means more expensive. LEDs, light emitting diodes. Uh, if you have done your surface mount uh, soldering project, you'll know that you had some diodes. They're kind of the same thing. They just aren't light emitting. Diodes have more than just um, a use for emitting light. Um, and you may have noticed that they're one way. Uh, they said you had to use the black line in a particular way on your search board. That's important. These are one-way components. You have to know which direction you're put, putting them in because the positive has to go on the positive side, the negative has to go negative. You can't reverse it. Um, in fact, here's how you figure it out. Generally speaking with LEDs, 
The longer side is the anode. That's positive. So make sure you connect the longer side. Of it. If you happen to clip it, though, you may not know what the longer side is anymore. When you get really good, you could actually look at your LED and be able to tell. Because inside you can see how the semiconductors are set up. Short of that, your digital multimeter can help you in this. There hopefully is a diode setting, and this will actually tell you what's positive, what's negative, or the continuity will do this the same way. And it'll tell you your voltage drop. Sometimes when you get a bunch of little LEDs and they're, they're like cheap, they may not even give you specs for them. You may not know the current that you can run on these things, you may not know the voltage drop, which is how much voltage it will draw when it's in a circuit. You may not know why it's running. I mean, there's some conventions for the simple ones, like you probably want to run it at 20 to 30 milliamps, and the colors each have different voltage drops. Reds are lower, blue range, you get higher. So, uh, a digital multimeter can help you with this. Yeah? Could you uh, maybe explain a bit more about voltage draw? I don't know if there is more to say. But... Yeah, well, okay, so all of your components run with current and voltage. It's the both, it's, it's both. So essentially when you have a circuit, a, a circuit and you have components in a series, you have your voltage before the component and after. It's going to change in a series circuit. So essentially, before your LED, you might have 3.3 .3 volts, but after, it's going to be minus whatever it is. So say, it's, say for instance, voltage drop on your LED is 2, which is more like probably a blue one. Then your voltage after the LED is 1.3. That is also how you kind of figure out what sort of resistance you need on your circuit. Because you can take your source voltage, subtract it from the voltage drop you found on your LED, divide it by the current you want it to run at, which the current will help determine the brightness. You don't want to get too high. Generally, you can, I think they say go half of what it is, and most simple LEDs is about 40 milliamps, so aim for about 20, 30 is not going to hurt you. I've done a little bit both on accident, and then on purpose. Actually, first, uh, but that's kind of the formula to help you with figuring out resistance. And all of your components generally will have a voltage drop, will have usage. Resistors included, but they tell you in ohms, and then you kind of have to calculate things out in reverse. So that's where you're going to start using things like the ohm's law. Because if you have your resistance, you have your current, you can find your voltage. If you have resistance in your voltage, you find your current. So you just need two out of three. And here's actually an example of my red LED on this board. So I actually ran all mine through my multimeter just to find the voltage drop. The red was 1.8, so there's a calculation. Now, you may not see it yet, but I'm using 220 ohm resistors for my LEDs. Not 75, which technically I don't know if there's an actual 75 resistor, I don't think so. There's 50s and there's 100s. Um, you can figure it out. You can go higher on resistance. You don't have to be exact. And the trick is, always be higher in resistance than what it actually requires. That's safe, because once again, we're working with analog. We don't actually know if it's going to be exactly these numbers, because it can shift, it can change. Electricity isn't necessarily going to just be on the numbers that you're at. We just kind of approximate. And things can change. So I was doing that kind of a safety measure. Essentially, I could have put 100s on there. I doubled them. Circuit diagrams. So also another thing about electronics, you'll see circuit diagrams for things. And I've got some for you too. Um, on the GitHub, you'll have them. I'll show a couple here. In fact, I think the same ones. But uh, you see all different types of symbols. You can look online, find out all the definitions. Here's just some that I, I showed off. In fact, that one we're using, we're not really using one. That's actually a battery. We're not using that. In fact, this is kind of the only one, though the we're using this one looks a little bit different than what it's LED. So here is actually the diagram for my button inputs. They're all the same. There's four button inputs. They all work the same way. Essentially, we have our voltage source, which is 3.3 3, uh, 3 .3 volts. I'm using a 10K ohm resistor. I'll talk about why. This is, I'm going to program this to be an input. Here is my momentary switch, so that's that. And then here is my ground. So that's it. That's, that's how you do an input for a series. Now, let's talk about why I'm using a resistor here. You never want to connect your input directly to ground or, um, or voltage without having a resistor. This is called a pull-up or pull-down resistor. You'll see that term. 
Don't be confused, it's not a special type of resistor. It's just terminology for its behavior. And its purpose is primarily to, re to prevent short circuits. If you didn't have that resistor there, and if you pressed your button, your voltage will go directly to ground, short circuit. This helps you. So while this is open, it doesn't really matter so much. It will also, they say, the reason they call pull-up down is because it kind of pulls the state of something high or low. That's true too. So I'm doing, if you connect your input to voltage, you're going to get high. If you press the button, you go low. But that resistor protects you from short circuits. That's its purpose. That's the thing to remember. So never connect your inputs directly to voltage and ground without having a resistor. Just remember that rule. And you can remember pull up and pull down um, just so that you know the terminology. And when you see someone talk about it, oh, OK, yeah, there's this. a lot of documentation I have um, that I went through. That actually was a big stumbling block for me. I spent like a week trying to figure out what a pull up and pull down resistor was. And you know, I got, I, and before I got in my head, oh yeah, I'm just trying to protect myself from short circuits. Just a quick question on that. Yeah. Once you press your momentary uh, button there, yeah. you're connecting GPIO indirectly to ground, right? Well, actually, yeah, well, it's connected through the circuit, but it's going to go path of, so my, my ends are technically high right now. Because right. of this, but it's going to go path of least resistance, so the voltage is actually going to go ground. That's going to set this to low. Right, right, got that. But so, you, you, but GPIO in, GPIO in would, at that point of the button contact, would be shorted directly to ground. But that's, but there, that's not a problem for the circuit, right? Because they're ends. Yeah, it's not a problem for the circuit because you because you program it and you're fine. Okay. If it was out and you set it to low, this would be a problem because that would be a short circuit. Out no works kind of out and in work kind of different. Output is really about sending out in and so it's actually expecting this. So it's okay. Okay. It's actually drawing. It's actually drawing um, from the three volt three. So that's why it's staying high. Here's my output also. Uh, kind of the same concept. I talked to you a little bit about LEDs and resistors. So you notice there's a resistor here. So there's my LED. Could be any one of the colors. It doesn't matter which order you put the resistors and the LEDs in. Um, I think, actually, I might have my, I have, no, I have resistors and LEDs. So I have them in reverse, and even my, what my diagram is showing. So it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you know what your resistor resistance should be based on your LED. And once again, I standardize it for ease. You could get specific. You could say, oh, OK, so the blues is actually like 2.1 in terms of voltage drop. That means I only need about a what, a 30 in terms of ohm? So maybe I can just go with a 50. You can do that, but it might be easier on you not to have to remember what your separate resistors are and just go something standard. And it's not going to really hurt your project, especially for the basic ones. If you need to get that specific, sure, go for it. But early on, you're probably not going to need to. Here's actually the full example. Everything's all together in terms of the diagram. So you got my four, out uh, got my four outputs, got my four inputs. And there you go. That's a circuit diagram. Uh, you won't know how to read them overnight, but it's really cool to actually be able to go online and start looking at other people's books. <coughs> I know what that is, so um, it's a fun way to start. And building your own diagrams also helps you remember later on what you did in your projects. I'm not sure how long we'll have this together, so I might want to put it together. So <coughs> this is my project. This is what I built. You'll see I've got my LEDs here. There's resistors behind them. Here's my buttons. There's resistors behind them. These are my outputs connected. These are my inputs. And then here is my voltage rail, which I have one on both sides. So you notice these two wires? These actually are connecting my rails together. So I'm only using one 3.3 volt pin and one ground pin to do everything. And so this is where the 3D3 is actually connecting to the ground. It's connecting on the other side. And then my circuits are happening here. And you'll notice they're kind of alternating. That's, once again, how you connect in series. You go from one row to the next. If you put everything on one row, it won't work. It's not going to connect right. All right, now let's get into a little bit of programming. So I actually did this in two languages, uh, Python and Perl. This is a quick uh, uh, tutorial on how I set it up. I'm not going to go into details. It's simple. Here is Python's button input. So you import your project, set your board, 
uh, board, uh, I don't know if you're in Kevin's, there's two types, board and BCM. Board actually is, this is the actual pin number on here. BCM is gonna be like a GPO number, which is based on your revision. So board is easier. Uh, set up your pin as an input, run a while loop, check for the input. If, uh, if it goes uh, down to low, that means it's being pressed, like I was doing, showing you the pull resistor, as soon as you connect it, it goes through. So I'm just saying it's depressed. That simple. LEDs, also very simple. Here's my package, here's board. Here's another fun thing. If you don't want annoying warnings, so when you set GPL pin to program them, if you don't clean up, it'll give you an error the next time you say, oh, someone else is using this. And you may even see that if you start using like some of the other pins. If you don't want to do that, you're just testing stuff, you're gonna turn off when you're done. It doesn't matter or reset when it boots anyway, so you can just turn off warnings. I'm setting up the out. Here's an output. So I set it to false because I want it down so that way current runs through. If it's high, that means it's high with the voltage source, so nothing's happening. No ground, no, no current's running. That's why you set it to false. So false and true, it, it could be based on how you have your circuit set up. It doesn't necessarily mean the same thing, it just depends. And then I'm setting it back to true, turns it off. Pearl, I did some Pearl too. Same kind of concept, really easy. You can just go ahead and download uh, the install and run, they have like an install script, or you can do it from CPAN, you might need to install it in GL as well. I did, because they have some uh, a graphical stuff too. A little bit more complicated on the Perl side. Uh, uh, I, I grabbed constants, I grabbed the device, but not much. I created my object. This is how you do setup. So, or, or I'm gonna say, I'm going to set up this pin. So I'm going to set up 12. I want it to be an input. Here's my while loop. Unless my value, I'm pressed. So while it's true, I'm not. As soon as it's false, I press. Same thing for the LED test. Uh, bring it in, new. I'm going to use this pin. This is going to be output. Set it to zero so it's false. So that means it's going to light up, sleep, <laughs> and now it's true, uh, which means it's going to turn off. Uh, I already showed you. I'll show you real quick because we're running out of time. And this is why I gave you the, uh, there it is. This is why I gave you the, uh, the get, uh, get up. Here's the actual program for this. So it's all built, you can play with it. It's pretty simple. I did do a lot more things like I did constants and stuff so I could keep it clean. And, uh, hopefully I've documented enough for everybody to read through it. You have, a, you have your game loop. Um, and essentially I'm going to be showing patterns and going the next round. So I'm doing lots of game terminology here too that you can kind of play with. In the init, there's all my setup stuff that you saw, so you can set everything up. I'm also doing interrupts in here. So instead of just doing while loops, I'm doing a vector, which is great. I highly recommend it because you don't want your input or the output trying to block whatever you're doing. If you do while loops, it's going to block it. You're going to be waiting for your input before you can actually, actually show your pattern. So use events. They actually work pretty decent. Um, this has program, uh, you can program debouncing this uh, on the uh, Python version. I couldn't find it actually on the full version, so I had a harder time. But uh, yeah, software debouncing is great. You can do that with capacitors and hardware too. You'll have to research it. But software debouncing, fantastic. Uh, then I'm doing a lot more with it, like here's my next round, so this is where I'm setting stuff up. Uh, creating random colors, show my pattern. Check my pattern, that's my, see if you actually did it right or not. Um, light up stuff, turn off the lights. Did I win the round? Great, this is what I'm going to do. Did I lose the round? Okay. Perl, same algorithm. And I tried to keep it similar so it's easy to follow whether you were doing Perl or Python. So I've got my constants, I've got my pattern set up. Game. Obviously, there's going to be some difference because we're dealing with different languages. Um, there's a little bit more also on the Perl side for, for setup. Uh, my interrupt handling. The one thing I don't like about Perl is I still have blocking I know with I just did the basics. So I actually did term repeats module that allowed me to do non-blocking I know in Perl. It was great at that point. So here's my patterns, uh, my light up. I tried to keep similar function names as well, so once again you can kind of compare and play with it. So and yeah, as you saw, I also put uh, in here. I put the button tests. Uh, for each, each language in, in, in addition to Pi. Also, last night I was having a lot of fun. 
So I included a, a light show, which, oh. Another thing to note, you need to run your Python as sudo. That's because it has to access the hardware. Um, the kernel needs sudo writes to do this. The Perl one, by the way, kind of does it for you behind the scenes. So it still happens, but it, just, it actually asks for writes. It didn't work. Oh, I know what I did. In light show, I uh, also included uh, the cleanup. I, I didn't really mention it, but with Python, there's also this nice little cleanup function you can do. When you're done, you can clean it after yourself. It's great, so if you want to gracefully exit your program, that's actually how you call it right there. So I set this one up so that it just runs, and then I can uncomment or comment this when I actually want to clean up on GPL. And so, there was also the light show. So this was something different. So I actually used the same project for a couple of days. I had the, you know, the, the simple tests and then the program, and then I just had fun and created this. So uh, that's pretty much it. Let me quickly run through the references. I'm not going to actually even say any of them. In fact, I'm just going to show them to you so that I can say that I did. And could you show your GitHub address again? Yeah, yes, that's at, actually at the end so that you guys can have access to that. And so there was a ton of references. I put books and tons of on online stuff for you guys. So um, I guess I'll look through. You can see them on the GitHub. You can see them in the slideshow. Um, all my attributions as well, uh, which I included myself just because I was lazy and didn't want to actually try to figure out, oh, is this mine or is this someone else's? So way too much. But yeah, there it is. So thank you guys so much for attending this early session. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have a lot of fun with your projects. Um, this is all on there for you. So if you want to replicate this, go for it. Or create something even cooler and tell me about it, please. So thank you, guys. Um. Uh, what's the